what I like to do here is try to uh, explain to you in 15 minutes, so it, it will be a very challenging job, uh, about this One Belt, One Row uh, initiative. So first of all, I'd like to go through a little bit the historical uh, issue, but we don't see that much. So it was a continuity, I would say it's a historical continuity. If you look back in the Chinese history, the, this uh, uh, blue line exists. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, 140 years before uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, during the uh, Han Dynasty, there was a very famous uh, Chinese uh, uh, grand voyageur named uh, Zhang Qian who did uh, a journey towards the, the west and, uh, and actually covered this the Central Asia area. This is what we call the Silk Road. And then during the Ming Dynasty, so it was of course uh, a thousand uh, five hundred, six hundred years later, there was uh, another a big uh, maritime uh, voyageur uh, named uh, Zheng He who traveled actually seven, seven times through the, the South China Sea to India, but also to uh, Kenya. So when you look at the new routes presented by the Chinese One by One Road Initiative, actually the origin came from uh, these uh, issues. And another important thing is that all the collaborations with different areas, different regions, it was also a, a recognition of a accumulation of historical alliance and, and, and collaborations. The, of course, the first country we, we like to emphasize is Pakistan. And as you know, Pakistan was for decades one of the most important partner of Chinese, both on the economic side, but also on the political side. Actually, Pakistan was the facilitator for the normalization of the relationship, diplomatic relationship between China and the US. And another important area is Central Asia. And you can see from here, actually, the economic development, but also the political collaboration started right after the, uh, the, the end of the Soviet Union and the creation of these um, uh, independent countries in the region. And you will also see the, the trade volume uh, between China and these areas uh, boomed already before the announcement of the One Belt, One Road. And another important area, of course, is Africa. Uh, I, I was fortunate to interview uh, President Jiang Jianqing when he was still the chairman of ICBC about his acquisition of uh, Standard Bank in, in, in Africa. It was really in this kind of moment, right before the one belt, one road. And of course, the, the last but not least, you also have the Southeast Asia, and China was observer and a, and a partner of this ASEAN since 2010. So you see that the coverage of these regions under the One Belt, One Road was done on, on the, a progressive uh, economic and political links, and of course, we should also mention uh, Europe, the importance of Europe in this uh, geopolitical uh, vision. And then later on, it was like uh, Pre President Jiang Jinping mentioned, four years ago, we had this uh, uh, nomination of One Belt, Run Road uh, by Xi Jinping, first in Central Asia, Central Asia, then in Indonesia, about this One Belt and the One Road. So this is an accumulation of, it's not just a sudden event, because many uh, uh, newspapers in, in articles in, in Europe present as, as, as a sudden event, which is not uh, the truth. And behind this uh, One Bell One Road initiative, there's uh, two big cornerstones. And this was repeated constantly by the Chinese political and business leaders. One is on the, this continuity, okay, on uh, creating more economic ties and enhance the cultural exchanges. So you have a soft side, people to people dialogue, but on the other side, of course, this, everything is built on this historical initiative, not just a, a, a modern day invention, okay? And just give you some numbers. If you look at the One Bell, One Road initiative, actually it covers, uh, according to the official announcement, uh, the, the, the forum in Beijing uh, last May, so 100 countries covered, okay? 60% of the population, and which represent more than 20% of the trade, okay? And also uh, uh, accumulated investment signed uh, between China over this One Bell, One Road is already uh, 126 billion US dollars, so it's a very big number. 
the, the initiative itself is much bigger than uh, these uh, infrastructure building uh, projects. So you see that, of course, there is a, a huge political policy coordination between China and uh, the, these One Belt, One Road countries. And uh, you also have this uh, uh, connectivity. So it's through, of course, the intangible, the tangible and the intangible infrastructures. Not only the, the railway, but also the telecommunication banking system and, 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 and the custom clearing system, etc., etc. You also have the trade side of the story, and behind all that, there is a huge, what we call the financial integration. This is exactly like a, a uh, Pro Professor Zhang Jianqin mentioned about this investment fund, big vehicles like his fund, but also China Development Bank, China uh, in Import and Export Bank, all the f commercial banks from China, but also have the Silk Road Investment Fund. But also behind that, there was al al also the swap of the, the RMB through the central banks of these uh, Belt and the Road countries. Okay? So, Another important uh, information I'd like to share with you is that uh, what Chinese uh, political leaders intend to, to replicate all over the world is also the, the miracle behind the economic success story that uh, Professor Jiang Jinxin just described in China. So if you look at uh, the Chinese situation, and you will see that there is a very interesting virtual circle uh, behind the Chinese development uh, story and so far so good. So the, f the starting point is something called the development finance and actually there was a book I really invite you to buy it and it's in English written by someone called Chen Yuan who was the chairman of uh, CDB, China Development Bank. And he wrote a book on the development finance and he, actually this is the core of the Chinese development which means there is a public-private collaboration and then the bank and the, the uh, the government will provide the market, uh, build the market beforehand, and first of all, on the infrastructure side. So you go down, so you have the infrastructure, and in Chinese there is a proverb saying that to get rich, build a road first. So for each province and cities and counties, the first thing they want to improve is the infrastructure. Once the infrastructure is, is built, and then of course this will create much more frequent and low cost business exchanges between the poor region and the connected region. So that will give boom up the consumptions in China. And once you have more consumptions from the area, of course this will facilitate the trade. And all that will bring more value to the infrastructure and the land actually you worked on at the, at the origin. And these land and infrastructure, they become a financially viable project, and then they can become the collateral for a next wave of development. So this is a Chinese economic development model. Okay? And they want to replicate that now to the Central Asia, to Africa, also to uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And so if you look at the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, exactly in the same way they start with the financing. Now we see a lot of uh, banks uh, and, and also funds are coming. They were in the first wave of investment will be made into the infrastructure. And once you have the infrastructure, you will boom the local employment and create, of course, the consumption, the local uh, economy, and which will create a lot of trade opportunities, again, not only for Chinese company, but for everybody. Once you have the trade, this will create more value to the real estate, the properties where the infrastructure takes place. And then this will provide more collateral uh, assets towards the next wave of financing and then you go into a virtual circle into these uh, underdeveloped areas, okay? So, if we go into the media uh, around the world, you see a lot of criticism. And I try to make a summary of this criticism, both in the media in the in US and Europe, uh, and I can only read uh, French or in English, so maybe in German you, you find exactly the same thing, I hope, oh, I wish. So, you have a lot of doubts about uh, the comparison with the Marshall pro Plan after the Second World War, and they also worried about the no 
uh, restriction of the finance use in the developing country without uh, anything tied with the political regime or uh, human rights or whatever. So, and of course, there are some doubts about the financial return of, of, on this project. And again, if you make a static analysis of this investment, I totally accept the conclusion made by the, uh, the, the, the German or the European newspapers. However, if you take a dynamic view uh, and if you make your uh, analysis based on the Chinese past experience, maybe your story is a little bit obsolete. If you make that static analysis, nobody should have invested anything in China, and we shouldn't have seen such a miracle in China. So everything is about the chicken and the egg. Okay, you don't see the chicken, you don't, don't have the egg. So this is a very interesting analysis, and you should look that at with a much more long-term and dynamic view. And the second area is in the local media, especially in, in Pakistan, in, in, in Sri Lanka, but also in, in African media, talking about the corruption in the local uh, environment, and also the, the debt. Uh, recently, we saw some articles about the, the rail, uh, railway project in Laos or the railway project in Kenya. There are some doubts about that. And of course, the, uh, if the investment will help uh, change the poverty situation in the country or it will uh, exacerbate the, the, the poverty issue. And there's also the protection of the environment concerns and of course some uh, racism, but this is minor, and of course money laundry, but this is also minor. The other issues, uh, I think it's relatively minor, but there are a lot of concerns about the corruption and the, the, the poverty issue uh, in the country. So what I'd like to share with you a little bit with some stories and first of all, we should have a much global vision of this one bell one road. And we tend to focus a lot on this uh, left-hand side about this tangible property, like railway, like highway, like some uh, uh, port uh, facilities, airport, or even hospitals or power stations. But however, what if we look inside into the uh, one bell one row, you see much more than the tangible uh, improvement, but also the lot of intangible improvement related to the banking system. Just give you an example, thanks to the interconnection between uh, ICBC and the Standard Bank, now if you wire some money in US dollar from China, from ICBC account to Standard Bank account, the money will arrive in 15 minutes. I think even between US or European banks, you cannot get this kind of efficiency. Okay? So, Electricity is also a big issue, especially in the countries like Pakistan. And I just recently talked with the, the Minister of Economic Development in Pakistan, and he confirmed that all these uh, new investment from China, not only that will bring a double-digit return, but also uh, help to ease the, the, the tension on the energy and electricity in, in, in Pakistan. And you also have all these te telecommunication systems. And if you go now to uh, any of these African countries, you can really experience very fast uh, 3G, 4G connections thanks to the Huawei's uh, continuous improvement in the local market. So you also have a lot of training programs provided by the Chinese. Again, as a, a school from China, a European Chinese school, we also provide a lot in Africa this kind of training to the high-level executives. And of course, the standardization of the service. So on one side, you don't have to worry that much about the investment because the investment are made by the Chinese anyway. But all these tangible and intangible infrastructures, they will stay. And they will lay a very interesting foundation for the development of this country. Actually, the opportunities created by Belt and Road Initiative will be open to everybody. And this is totally different from the colonization period of Central Asia by Soviet Union or Africa by France or UK, because at that time, all the infrastructure was just made good enough to link to the colonizer, okay? So the, all the railway and highways from Central Asia will go to Moscow, basically. And in Africa, you see exactly the same 
non-connection between the different countries. When the Chinese arrived, the philosophy is totally different. So they will create a huge integration of the local market, which means then you can finally talk about Central Asia or Africa as a whole market. This will bring you a huge economic economy of scales and also the, 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 the global way when you to, to do the integration about promoting your consumption goods or some services in the area. Okay? And, and one thing I, I always say to my uh, uh, non-Chinese friends, I say, don't underestimate the patriotism and the smart the intelligence of these uh, business leaders in Pakistan or in Africa because they are much more international than the Chinese leaders, sorry to say that, because they are graduated from all the elite schools in UK, in France, in US, and they can read fluently uh, in English, in French, they know everything happening in the world. So when they negotiate with Chinese, they are not dummies. So they will protect their interests. You don't have to have concern for themselves. They will protect their interests. So don't worry about that, okay? So, once you have that, just look at a very interesting new example recently happened in Kenya. As you know, there is a now a new uh, railway between um, the city called Mombasa, close to the sea, the Indian Ocean, and then to Nairobi. But this is just the first trench of the, the railway network. Actually, the original plan will be a railway network link the whole eastern and central Africa. And again, if you compare before and after, the infrastructure would totally change the, the scenery of this region because this region will finally become integrated and for the, 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 the different companies, and when I talk with the company, US company like FedEx, recently we invited the, the, the boss of FedEx on campus in Shanghai, and he gave a very interesting talk about how they rely on the one bell one row to build the world-class logistic network now in Africa. They are investing like a hell to build a lot of logistic centers because they know that with all these roads, this will boom for their business. And recently I was also in, in France talking with the Unilever CEO for Africa, he's a French, and he also mentioned that although they are now they are in Africa for more than 100 years, now they are waiting the Chinese one bell one row uh, construction to bring the market together. So they will really enjoy, finally, the economy of scales to move the goods easily from one country to another. So for, for Germany, I think there's two issues we can look on. Uh, first of all, uh, German itself is located in the center of Europe. So if we can take the advantage of this infrastructure investment from China, and we can really build Germany as the logistic center uh, in, 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 in Europe. On the other side, German as a top manufacturer of equipment and also a top service, financial service, consulting service provider, you can also enjoy greatly the opportunities offered by the One Bell One Row initiative. Okay? So, uh, as a summary, One Bell One Row is an interesting facilitator of global trade. So, it's not just about the infrastructure building. So, it will build the perspective of developing an advanced economy altogether, especially on the Euro-Asia continent. And this will also uh, improve the, the cost, uh, especially the transportation cost, communication cost among this region, and this will unlock the key markets, the, the, the next wave of consumption and the global growth potential uh, from this region. So I just stop here, thank you very much.